The University of Pretoria is a multi-campus public research university. It is a university that aspires to be internationally competitive and nationally relevant. As a shining example, the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences has academic and research programs that are proven to consistently conform to the highest of international standards. The faculty has four fields of specialization and aims to continuously strengthen its position as a leading institution in these fields through its academic and research excellence. The faculty pledges social integration and is known to be technically well-rounded. But above all, the faculty strives to assure that the market value associated with its degrees will always be of a competitive benefit to its students. In a world that is becoming more competitive by the moment, it is essential that students not only gather the education and skills necessary to perform in the marketplace, they should also receive practical experience that places them in the optimal position to find and keep the right jobs. This is what the departments in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences offer. It is the combination of real-world application by working closely with industry partners along with the cutting-edge academic expertise of the top-rated and internationally recognized lecturers who have a great understanding of the expectations of global and local industries that make the difference. We strive to produce graduates that appreciate the importance of community, entrepreneurial endeavor and innovative action. EMS graduates are a new generation of future thought leaders who will create jobs and make a positive impact nationally and internationally. Make today matter. Good morning. I'm Elsa B. Lewitz, the Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria. It is my privilege to welcome you to this webinar where the discussion will focus on Prof. Weisman Akushlu's recent published book entitled Enabler or Victim, KPMG South Africa and State Capture. It is indeed our privilege to have the distinguished author, Prof. Weisman Akushlu, here today to discuss his book. He is, amongst all the hats that he wears, also the Chancellor of the University of Pretoria. We are further privileged to have our Vice-Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupi, as facilitator of the panel discussion. The other two distinguished panel members are Professor Mervyn King, known as Mr. Corporate Governance, and Professor Karen Barak, a Professor in Auditing at the University of Pretoria, and the Deputy Dean for Research and Postgraduate Studies of the Faculty. Their detailed bios have been included in the programme. This webinar is an important event that forms part of the centenary celebrations of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences this year and is presented under the EMS Talk series of the Faculty. I trust that you will enjoy the event. I now call on our Vice-Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupi, to facilitate the webinar. A very good morning to everyone who's listening to this, uh, participating in this webinar. And good afternoon, by the way, and good evening, because we might have some global audiences. We have for our webinars a lot of our alumni and associates uh, signing in. This is a great day uh, for the investor of Pretoria in the sense that uh, we happen to be coincidentally unfortunate that our chancellor <laughs> is an accountant and he's published this book on accounting. Our chancellor also, by the way, was the first black uh, chartered accountant. And also he was a vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria. So there's layers of history here today. And also to have Mr. Corporate Governance is also, you know, quite prestigious, uh, quite respectable, and adds gravitas to the event, and our own Professor Barak, a leading scholar in auditing. Allow me now to quickly introduce our panel, and then to go on into this reflective discussion on this very, very important day. University of Pretoria, as you also know, happened in this year to have four 
of its students in the top 10 students in the first uh, professional exam for the accounting. So it's the home of accounting. Prof. Lumgile Wiseman-Kutlu was inaugurated as the Chancellor of the University of Pretoria in March 2007 and is currently the chairperson of KPMG South Africa. He was elected president of South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, known as SAICA, and served two terms from April 1998 to, to April 2000. He served as economic advisor of the President of the Republic of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, and as the Executive Secretary of the New Partnership for Africa's Development between 2000 and 2006, a continental institution responsible for economic development. He was also a trustee of the IFRS Foundation, overseeing the development of accounting standards between 2013 and 2018. He's passionately involved with the development of black accountants and is the patron of the Nkuhlu School of Accounting at the University of Fort Hare. Professor Karen Barak is the Deputy Dean Research and Postgraduate Studies in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria. She's an NRF rated researcher and has led various research teams in South Africa and elsewhere. Locally, her research had a marked impact on the internal and external audit professions when she led the CA 2025 research team to develop competency frameworks for the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, SICA, and the Independent Regulatory Board of Auditors, known as AIBA. Professor Mervyn King, Mr. Corporate Governance, a global governance expert, is a senior counsel and former judge of the Supreme Court of South Africa. He's also an honorary professor at Wits University. He's a chair emeritus of the King Committee on Corporate Governance in South Africa, which produced King One, King Two, King Three, and King Four, and the chair of the Good Law Foundation. He's also chair emeritus of the International Integrated Reporting Council in London and of the Global Reporting Initiative in Amsterdam. He chaired the United Nations Committee of the Eminent Persons on Governance and Oversight and was president of the Advertising Standards Authority for 15 years. He has been a chair, director, and chief executive of several companies listed on the London, Luxembourg, and Johannesburg stock exchanges. Welcome to my esteemed panel, and, and I think we're going to give an interesting run to the public. This is an interesting book, uh, 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 panelists. Now I'll start with you, Professor Karim Barak. What are your views on Professor Nkuklu's book? And the book, uh, just as a reminder to the audience, Enabler or Victim, KPMG South Africa, and State Capture MMO. Mind you, KPMG is one of the four top auditing firms in South Africa. So we're talking about a very important institution in this context. So, Prof. Barak, your views. First, I want to commend Professor Nkuklu for having the courage to present this insider view of the KPMG South Africa saga. While the debate is continuing as to whether KPMG South Africa was an enabler or a victim in its associations with corporate as well as public sector South Africa, I see Professor Kushler's book as being an enabler or motivator to restore the trust in the South African profession. I agree with Professor Nkuchlu that there has been a logic shift in the audit field. The taken for value, value for taken abilities and values that used to define the profession have changed. Its orientation changed from a professional logic to a commercial logic. And auditors have to carefully balance these competing logics. And increasingly, their decisions are being questioned. One should, however, realize that this logic shift is also evident in most professional fields. And we've also seen it manifesting in second tier as well as lower, oh, yeah. um, smaller audit firms. Yeah. So that was like an icebreaker to what I, how I want us to conduct this, uh, the, this discussion. So Prof Nkoshu, I'll go to you and say, do you think that is an accurate summarization of the book 
and could you take the audience into your confidence about what is in the book? Yes, it's a good uh, summary and I agree with that. Really, uh, what really motivated me to write the book, as you would appreciate, is the challenges that I faced at KPMG. I was called by KPMG to come and lead the firm out of the crisis. So I had to do a lot of analysis and also do a lot of reading to try and understand why KPMG South Africa, a firm with a long history of success and with a very good reputation, would ignore information that was available in the market and end up um, you know, finding itself in a situation that uh, compromise its brand and reputation almost to the, uh, uh, you know, caused its collapse. Why were, was the information in the marketplace ignored? I struggled with that. So that is why in the book I have five themes really. The, the first part of the book I discuss the question of um, the desires that drive our behaviors. In particular, uh, uh, desires that drive the behaviors of professionals and business leaders. Then I move on to deal with the crisis at KPMG and say how these drivers may have influenced the behavior at KPMG and led to the crisis. And then uh, that's followed by my attempt at defining the root causes of a crisis, what really caused the crisis. And then having then um, explained the root causes or discussed the root causes, the next chapter, the next part of the book, I come up with the uh, I would say uh, measures, uh, a number of measures that are now the foundation of the renewal of KPMG. They cover governance, risk management, audit quality, and so on. And then towards the end, I draw lessons that I believe should inform the reforms that we have to introduce in the auditing profession. And then I end up with uh, lessons for professionals and leaders. Because I believe that uh, what happened at KPMG is of relevance to all leaders and professionals, especially of organizations uh, that really uh, are significant and play uh, important roles in society. Going back to the first theme then, uh, dealing with the um, desires that drive uh, behaviors. I draw from a number of scholars, but I focus on two. I say that our behaviors are driven by self-interest that we all know for physical interest, uh, for our existence and drive our own egos and all that. But I also say the other driver is that of moral recognition as human beings and also as beings that really aspire for recognition for, not, for recognition of our dignity as people. And it is an understanding of our purpose for existence, our purpose in society that really should drive our behaviors. So I use that uh, foundation to try and, and analyze what happened at KPMG and what has happened to the audit profession. I say what really has happened in the audit profession, the profession is founded on a profound purpose that is expected to fulfill a society. That purpose is to enhance trust in financial reports. Mm. It has the 
prestigious role of saying to chief executives of big companies, to heads of state, that uh, until such time, your financial reports to the public are checked and verified by a member of this profession that they are truthful. Society will not accept them as being really a truthful reflection of what has happened to that company. So it's a very prestigious organization, uh, institution. But the point I'm arguing there is that this pride in these very important papers in society has tended to be compromised, in my view, by the fact that uh, what really aspires auditors, what chief executives of audit firms talk about in their firms and promote is the one uh, is they put uh, up front as the most important priority commercial success. And secondly, they put up front uh, recognition by the clients that they serve of the dazzling solutions to business, complex business problems. And they don't say much about the purpose of protecting society and serving the public interest. So if you have got that kind of situation, a profession whose pride and uh, reason for existence should be serving the public interest and seeking recognition for being protectors of the public now has elevated the, 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 the role of delighting the clients and also commercial success as the drivers of, 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 of their behavior. You, you, you end up with a conflict that in my view is, has caused uh, doubt in the minds of the public as to whether this profession is still committed to its original purpose for existence, which is to protect the public, in other words, to serve the public. That's what I deal with in that chapter, in, in that chapter and I'm challenging, actually, all professionals and business leaders to ask themselves this question. What really drives them as leaders? Do you want just to be seen to be commercially successful? Or do you really value more the, mor the, uh, the moral purpose of your organization? If I would link my argument there to the lessons that uh, Professor Mervyn King has been promoting over his career, you must, your business must really be motivated by a bigger purpose to fulfill a, a greater, uh, to, to contribute to a greater public good. In, in, in the great reporting, he talks about um, environment, he talks about social imperatives, he talks about protecting the climate. But I'm saying, as leaders, we must interrogate ourselves. What is re really driving our behavior? If we don't embrace the moral purpose for the business that we run and let that moral purpose inform what we do, there's a danger that there will be more company scandals. It won't just be KPMG. It could happen to a university. It could happen, happen to other companies. So I, I, I deal with that at length in that, uh, at the beginning of the book. And then that's, that's to me, my challenge to professionals and uh, business leaders, primarily accountants and auditors, to look at what drives their conduct. In that, in, that's, that's why I begin the book. I struggled a lot with that when I was um, considering what really I must do when, when, when I, I, I accepted the role. But uh, I'm not going to be long, but the second chapter, the second part of the book theme is I, 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 in three chapters, I, I, I analyze what really the, 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 the nature of the crisis. I say, I analyze the behaviors, the mindsets of the professionals at KPMG. And also I analyze 
their attitudes when this uh, outcry came for the first time, there was these exposures in the papers that the firm was involved in, was complicit in state capture and corruption. What was the reaction of the partners and so on? Not surprising in a way, the initial reaction was one of disbelief, which over time uh, developed into denialism. No, disbelief in that uh, when you are a, 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 a firm, an audit firm, believing that you are founded on ethical conduct, integrity, objectivity, independence, and so on, suddenly there is evidence now in the marketplace that not only one, possibly two, three of your fellow partners have actually been exposed as being behaving in, um, in manners that are unethical, and also they have been found to have produced work that was not of the that was not in full compliance with the standards how do you react to that i think it's natural you you tend to disbelieve and deny but in my view it should not end there as a leader you should say my reputation and brand my role to make sure that my organization contributes to the public good and the name of my firm is not seen to be uh, doing things that are harmful to society. You would stand up and say immediately, not in the name of KPMG, and take a stand as a leader. I believe that the leadership of KPMG took too long to take a stand and say that these things cannot, be, cannot happen in our name. So what happened, they de delayed, and it was only KPMG International that said, we cannot stand by when our reputation is being uh, damaged the way that is happening in South Africa. They, they, they came up. So in that, I deal with those things, trying to understand them. And then, um, you know, another lesson that I think is important, not only for KPMG and the audit profession, is that because of this difficulty of professionals or leaders in a business to appreciate that even if there are one or two incidents of unethical conduct, of, impl of being compl implicated in, 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 in bad, in corruption. It's just too, too much, if, you, if you're really proud of your, of, your, of, your, of, your, of your reputation. You must respond by saying, let's review the work habits, the behaviors in the whole organization, not be satisfied in just dealing with those that have been exposed. So this was a difficult part in my engagement with KPG, but I, I understood that after the VBS implosion in particular, that no, 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 it's not enough to say we must make sure that the two or three partners that have been exposed should be disciplined and possibly they, they should uh, be, uh, their membership uh, of, of, of ERBA should be revoked. That was not enough. I said, no, no, let's dig deep and get to understand how it came about that people with such flawed characters could survive and prosper in the firm for as long as they did. So for me then it, it, it required, after VBS, I was pleased when the, the chairman, global chairman of KPMG agreed when I said, I no longer trust now the culture at KPMG. What I need done is that each and every auditor's uh, commitment to quality and integrity must be reviewed by partners coming from outside KPMG just to check and satisfy ourselves that these incidents are not reflective of a culture at KPMG. That was a difficult decision, but I took that. We're very proud of that. Actually, I advise that whoever is the leader of a firm that gets in a situation where its culture, its commitment to ethics is questioned. You must go beyond just, just saying, I'm dealing with the two or three that have been uh, identified. So th th that's a uh, good lessons there, but not to take too much time. After that, then, I identify the root causes. To me, the, the major root cause is this issue of saying, what is the primary purpose for the existence, moral purpose? Moral purpose means a purpose that impacts pos positively on society, 
on the environment and on the planet. You must ask yourself each time that whether the behavior of... So for me, I think the audit firms um, uh, had a disconnect with that and really allowed themselves to be overtaken by this ambition of commercial success and pleasing the clients. And then having dealt with, having dealt with, the, with that part, dealing with the root cause, and then I come up with a no, number of measures for renewing the firm. They have to do one with the appointment of a leader from outside the firm that has credentials that clearly show that in his career or career, the, the leader has distinguished himself as a person who really is guided by a moral purpose. And let that be the leader now that is going to champion the renewal of the culture in the organization. So to me, having done that, then we had to deal with the culture. We also had to deal with the technical issues of uh, audit uh, quality controls, of risk management, and so on. So it's a long list, uh, but I encourage people who are in professional organizations and uh, business leaders to look into that. And then having dealt with that, having said that this is the foundation now for the for a renewed KPMG, we are going to do the following things. Then from that experience, I go on then to draw lessons that, in my view, should be at the center of renewal of the profession in South Africa. So I deal with the issue of um, considering operational separation between auditing and uh, consultancy in our firms. I deal with the issue of dealing with the concentration. In other words, taking deliberate, delib deliberate steps to increase the number of audit firms that have capacity and capability to do audits of, of listed companies from four possibly to eight or ten. And I believe that there must be de deliberate policies that will be implemented to leaders towards that. I also deal with a very important question regarding audit firms, which of course I know I'm not going to be popular for that. I question the owner management governance structure that have characterized audit firms. They are owned, they are managed by their own shareholders and owners in terms of their boards and so on. So I say no. We serve, as audit firms, we serve a public interest. Therefore, uh, global experience, also as um, championed by Professor Mervyn King, has shown that public interest entities should be governed through boards that are composed of uh, a majority of independent non-executive directors. I explained the, 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 the need for diverse skills and backgrounds in doing that, and I'm challenging audit firms that because they serve a public interest, not only their own members, they should comply with best factories for public interest entities. So uh, possibly uh, I'll end there, Professor Cooper. Yeah. But thank you very much for you as vice chancellor of the university for creating this platform and give me an opportunity to share the ideas that I try to promote through the book. Thank you to Professor Mervyn King for dignifying this occasion with his presence and to Professor Barak and uh, the Dean of the F Faculty, Professor Lutz. I'm very grateful. And I hope really this will be a contribution, humble contribution that will be, will make, will get people at least thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Kuchu. I think weighty matters and I think uh, insight and foresight that you, you raise in there. I'll come to you shortly, Prof. Mervyn King. But Prof. Barak, based on the lessons and which he elucidated very clearly just now in Prof. Kuchu's book and what KPMG has undoubtedly learned from this nightmare, uh, almost an existential nightmare, as, as, as Prof. said, that nearly destroyed KPMG South Africa. What do you see as the key markers and objectives in the way forward for the auditing industry? Thank you, um, Prof. Kupe. I want to put this in context of a critical observation that Prof. Nkuhle has made in his book by claiming that in developing countries, 
possibly because of their distrust in official institutions or the weakness of these institutions, that there's an extremely high level of reliance placed on auditors. We need to understand that public and society expects more of auditors. In fact, particularly, they expect auditors to detect fraud as well as corruption. Yes. But within the audit environment, this is not a straightforward forward task. It is also not easy to be an auditor today. Businesses are more complex and the complexity are increasing. And furthermore, the boards and management of um, companies are very strong. Our research shows that it takes an individual auditor with extremely high levels of professional skepticism, as well as courageous leadership to stand up against these boards of directors or management. Furthermore, auditors need multidisciplinary teams to perform the audit. So much of the expertise that they require is not directly audit or accounting related, and they have to rely on other experts. And some of these experts, many of them, are situated in the consulting divisions of auditors, which make that, that separation between consulting as well as auditing very difficult. We've seen now, based on high profile scandals in the UK, that in, there was an agreement reached between the big four as well as the UK regulator that they will separate their um, consulting divisions from the audit divisions. However, the audit profession has also been criticised for always being responsive rather than proactive. Locally as well as globally, um, it has become almost a ritual that an audit, audit failure or an ethical lapse have been followed by improved regulation. So, is regulation the answer? Is the split between the different divisions of audit firms the answer? I think the answer lies in a multifaceted approach. And in this approach, each of the levels require strengthening. So first of all, I think stronger, much stronger sanctions, or at least the vigorous implementation of the sanctions that we have on the books. I think Corporate governance is a collective responsibility, as Judge King acknowledges, and therefore the um, directors, um, auditors, etc., should share some of the responsibility. I also believe that um, the public needs to see that wrongdoing is punished, and therefore are no processes of lengthy, but we want decisive action from regulators, professional bodies, and law enforcement um, agencies. And the media must continue to play that important watchman, watchdog role. But additional funds must be allocated to, the me to investigative reporting, so as to support stakeholder activism with much more accurate and informed, informed views. Then I also believe that professional bodies and regulators should also strengthen their own inspection processes and they should carefully balance their efforts to reach different objectives like transformation, competency and relevance. And these should simultaneously be done with care not to compromise audit quality. And of course, audit firms need to learn from the KPMG saga. As educators, we also have a responsibility. It's not good enough to deliver graduates with fit for purpose or relevant skills and technical knowledge. But when they work and they become a member of a profession, they should have a deep realization that with the, uh, the status as well as with the financial benefits that's attributable to a profession comes a large responsibility and that is to act in public interest. I just want to close off with a remark that today's world has changed. We live in an interconnected work world where expert knowledge is becoming a mere commodity. 
There are those that believe that professions will even stop existing as, as they are currently defined. I, however, am still hopeful that the distinguishing factor will be that professional logic or as Professor Nkuklu explained to us, that moral purpose of audit firms. So for me, audit firms' bargaining tool for its future relevance seems to hang on its ever-improving audit quality. Thank you, Prof. Barak. I'll come back to you about the responsibility of educating these professionals. Thanks. Prof. Mervyn King, I thank you again for being here with us. In the context of the KPMG South Africa experience, what are your views about audit liability? Well, this is of great concern, and this was one of the motivators for me to write my book, The Auditor Quo Vadis, Where To? Because um, Prof. Kushlu has referred to maybe there should be eight big firms, but I call the big four the final four. <laughs> because if any one of them had to collapse, it would be disastrous to the profession. And the reason for that is that you actually need these big four with their balance sheets to acquire their artificial intelligence to keep the profession up to date. And second tier firms haven't got that capital, haven't got the balance sheet to do it. There's also the question of a cooling off period so to get second-tier firms to become a co-auditor to a bank in terms of the Banks Act, for example, as the Act now stands, they've got to cool off for five years. So if they've been doing any work for that bank, for example, advising on tax, for example, they've got to cool off for five years. They're trying to change that to one or two years at the moment. But let's assume it's two years. Even during that two-year period, They've got to raise capital in order to acquire the artificial intelligence. Secondly, they've got to upskill. So from a cash flow point of view, it's almost an impossible task. Because where's the collateral? The collateral, of course, can only be the flow of fees. But their fees are actually going to drop during the cooling off period. So this packs on the question of mandatory audit firm rotation which I think is going to actually lead to cha huge challenges for the profession. But I call it the final four because the claims against the big four run into hundreds of millions of dollars, US dollars. As the four of us are sitting at the moment, the big four are exposed to hundreds of millions of dollars of claims. Why? When a limited liability goes bankrupt, the liquidator sees the auditor, who's compelled to have prudential insurance, as having the deepest pockets. Now, I've been in the corporate world academically and as a practitioner, chairman, directors of companies. I can give you my assurance. I've never seen one corporate failure where the sole cause is an audit failure in the sense that an international standards of auditing there hasn't been the dotting of I's or the crossing of T's in regard to that standard. That's the sole cause of the bankruptcy. Not so. It's a conglomeration of events. The chief operating officer has gone rogue or something. But the problem with the law in certain jurisdictions, which includes South Africa, is that in other jurisdictions, when KPMG, let's say, is sued, KPMG can join the CFO, can join the COO, can join the CEO, or can join a major supplier who supplied defective parts, let's say, for example, to say, when you look at the collapse of this company, there was a conglomeration of causes. And a court then has a right to apportion blame. But our Supreme Court of Appeal has held that our Apportionment of Damages Act only applies to delictual situations. So, for example, if you and I are driving our cars and we leave an uncontrolled, in, we collide at an uncontrolled intersection, I'm doing 50 k's an hour and you, Professor Cooper, are doing 100 k's an hour, <laughs> the court's going to make you pay more damages than me. 
it's got that that can apportion blame. But the appointment of an auditor is by way of contract, and liability under a contract is 100%. It's unlimited. So at the moment, an auditor carries 100% of blame. Now, as I've said, I've never in my 50 years of experience seen a case where you can attribute sole blame to an audit failure in the sense that they haven't crossed dotted the I's across the T's on international standards of auditing. So I pose the question in my book, why is it at the beginning of the process, when directors make a business judgment call, that they're protected by the business judgment rule, which simply says this, if you've got no conflict or interest in the matter, objectively speaking, you have all the facts. And with the wisdom of hindsight looking back five years later, it seems to have been a rational business decision at that time in those circumstances, even though it turns out to be harmful to the company. You escape liability. So take it through the fiscal period, let's say four fiscal periods at the end. The auditor, objectively speaking, has all the facts. The auditor has no conflict, hasn't done anything wrong from a code of conduct point of view, be it Herbers or the internal code of conduct of KPMG. And at the time, it looks like a rational opinion to give an unqualified audit opinion. But looking backwards, well, you didn't dot that I, you didn't cross that T. There should be an ability to say this was a rational auditor at the time to give an unqualified opinion. That auditor should escape liability. So what I am advocating, there should be an auditor judgment rule the same as there's a business judgment rule. Because the auditor has got this sort of Damocles hanging over his or head all the time of liability. And it's a huge problem. And then just on the question of auditor liability, I think one has to think of a canine mentality. An auditor must not be a lapdog. It is not a bloodhound. It is not there. The expectation gap out there is enormous. They actually believe that the auditor, for example, draws the financial statements, which is nonsense. It's drawn by the directors, according to IFRS standards in this part of the world. And the job of the auditor is to make sure that the drafter of these financial statements have done it so that it's a fair reflection of the financial position of the company according to these standards. That's the auditor's job. The auditor is not there to sniff out fraud, et cetera, et cetera, or wrongdoing. It's not a bloodhound. At the most, it's a watchdog. But liability is a curse to the profession. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Prof. King. I'll, I'll come to you with the second question now. But I just want to remind viewers to please post qu questions to all our panelists or even comments uh, as we go along, and then I will channel those questions to the panelists. Prof King, in commerce and industry, there has been a shift, uh, and I think you have written about this, in focus to stakeholder and broader society's interests. And I think Prof Kutlu was also making the same argument. Rather than the narrowly defined interests of shareholders, how do you see the way forward for the auditing profession in this regard? Well, I think the auditing profession has got to fit into the narrative. The 20th century was a century of unsustainable development because we followed the financial capital model underpinned by the primacy of the shareholder. And directors believed wrongly that their job was to increase the value for shareholders. And uh, increasing the wealth of shareholders, the principle would be that it would trickle down to the impoverished at the bottom. Increase wealth at the top and it comes down to the bottom. That trickle, I'm afraid, became treacle. It stuck at the top, it did not come down. Eventually it exploded, as we all know, in 2008. But throughout the latter half of the 19th century, throughout the 20th century, and turning into the 21st century, no company, limited, li limited liability company, operated in a financial bubble. It always operated in the triple context of the economy, society, and the environment. 
what happened was there was a focus on prosperity and ignoring the adverse impacts on society and the environment. And the bottom line profit and the criteria of success was increased profit, increased dividends, increased share price. If you achieved those three things, you were successful. But they never looked at the fact that a lot of those bottom lines were being subsidized by society and the environment. With the consequence by 1997, we were able to empirically establish that in the main companies, we as individuals to a lesser extent, had used them, were using natural assets faster than nature was regenerating them. Clearly not a sustainable matter. And we turn into the 21st century knowing that we've got seven and a half billion people at the moment, but by 45, 50, we're gonna have 9.3 billion people. And while population is increasing and the demand for product is increasing, natural assets are declining. So quite clearly, you can't carry on business as usual, to quote Paul Pullman. You've got to change that mindset. And that's why when I was chairman of the United Nations Eminent Persons Group on Governance and Oversight, I was telling Karen earlier that uh, there was a meeting of IFAC at the United Nations where the president and the chief executive discussed the World Bank was there and some iconic companies like Nestle, Unilever, HSBC, Chatham House Rules at that time, they said, well, we must concede looking at the makeup of the market capitalization of companies around the world, and we looked at the S&P 500 there, that at that time only about 18% of the market cap of some great companies were reflected as additives in a balance sheet according to financial reporting standards. The rest were the so-called non-financial issues. So I also became chairman of the Global Reporting Initiative, the main standard setter for sustainability reporting. And sustainability reporting became more and more important. And it is forming a greater part now called ESG, environmental, social and governance issues, mm. of the value of a company. So why am I talking at length about this? Because since January of this year, during the pandemic, there's been a rethink because the S and ESG has stuck its head up and corporate leaders have seen the critical importance of environmental, social and quality governance. So the question arises, is auditing, should auditing just focus on the financial capital? Mm -hmm. In my judgment, no. Mm -hmm. We need re-education of auditors to be multidisciplinary auditors. And at the moment, there is a collaboration that's happened in the world with framework providers, the statements of intent which have been done. As chairman of the IRC, I started the corporate reporting dialogue to get these framework providers together. And I, I said publicly that it was a social outrage that these framework providers were dealing with public interest issues and yet saw them, each other as competitors. But they had the same public good outcome, namely, to make accountability more informed. Because you couldn't just do an AFS according to IFRS, it was only dealing with say 16% of the value of the company. So you need the IAASB, the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, to work closely with these now collaborators to make sure that the education of, of young accountants who become registered auditors have this multidisciplinary learning where they can actually go out and use IASE 3000 revised and have emerging extended standards of auditing, that they can actually do the audit of these critical issues of people and planet and not only the financial. And that's a gap that's existing in the auditing profession. And that's what motivated it, we say, quo vadis, where to? If you're only auditing the latest figures on the S&P just by the way, Wiseman, you will find this frightening. It's 9%. It's reflected in the balance sheet according to US GAAP. 9%. That is frightening. And e of course, ESG has taken on a huge more importance since, since the pandemic. So we need to change the syllabuses and the teaching. And that's why I started the Good Governance Academy in early 2019 to get that thought leadership in and to 
teach our teachers to teach these things to our young students, that they come out as conscious corporate leaders, but with this multidisciplinary knowledge and not just focused in a silo on, the, on just the financial issues. Prof. Barak, I guess that goes back to you. So what, what <laughs> is... So, but what are we doing concretely to do those yes. things that... Uh, Unfortunately, universities are... Even... Uh, now I must choose my words very carefully. But we teach in silos. And we don't really follow that integrated approach. Accounting and auditing students sometimes don't even understand how business works. What about the broader context of business, mm. which mm. Professor King has just learned? So therefore, we have our work to be done. We, we have to follow a much more integrated approach by, the, by means of how we're going to teach. Not only that, but also by means of what we're going to teach, the topics that we're going to cover. Over the past years, accounting and auditing students were acknowledged, South African students, for their technical knowledge. It's not only the technical knowledge that counts, it's also the other knowledge, that the understanding of the broader concepts of how business functions within the environment, how business function within all the external factors that influence them. And we have to spend more time to develop that. In addition to that, it's important that our graduates must be able to develop during their traineeship that critical professional skepticism. And we need to also lay the foundation to teach that. It's difficult to teach that at a university, and most of the development in that field happens in the workplace when they do their traineeship, etc. But if you look at the foundation, it is critical thinking, it is problem solving, at his judgment skills. So those things we need to embed. And that can only be embedded if you have an integrated approach. Because you have to look at problems from different sides and different perspectives. So that's sort of my comment. Mm. So, so, so just to push you a little bit there, it's <laughs> one of the things that uh, UP is quote unquote famous for is that at least 33,000 of us, of the 55,000 students we have, uh, engage in some form of social engagement or community engagement projects, either as part of the course, in other words, integrated into the course mm -hmm. and compulsory and credit bearing, or if you like, in the more space of volunteerism in order to train socially sensitive and engaged students. Shouldn't we require that of all accounting and auditing students? We did some research a few years ago um, to um, determine the new competency framework for SICA as well as the RBA. And we also um, ask questions about uh, education models and training models. And three types of education models came out. More a technical focus and a social focus, which then are embedded in understanding business in the broader context and also practically be involved in, in, in community engagement processes and in a business component. So I think you need all of those three together mm. by, the, by means of how you're teaching. I believe that one should follow a much more business school approach, much more case study driven when you teach um, uh, students to become auditors or accountants. There's a question there which anyone of you can answer from Guy Harris. He says, is root cause not greed-driven, rather than professional ethics? Uh, yes, if I may uh, comment on that. You know, that is why in the book I say I spent quite some time talking about the desires that drive oh, yes. behavior. And I make the point that uh, the natural thing, all species are driven by self-interest to survive. And uh, but the, the problem is that if that becomes a dominant driver of behavior, that is just what is good for yourself, uh, pleasure for yourself, accumulating wealth for yourself, you can end up with the planet crashing. That is why 
you know, uh, one way of dealing. I, I accept that that, that 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 is one thing. But what I'm say, what I'm saying that really is not true that human beings and leaders are driven only by that. But there are cases where the leaders of the firm or the company get carried away and become predominantly driven by desire for maximizing commercial gain, bonuses for themselves, in other words, by greed. But I'm saying where the right tone is set for an organization, surely the things that make people feel good about themselves in when, is when there's a moral purpose for driving it. So I'm starting, I, I, I make a, a big issue about that. You know, if you look at our situation in South Africa, for instance, the reason we have the crisis we have is that we are driven possibly by the just desire for us, for ev everyone to acquire the next car, the next home, and so on. And this thing of moral purpose, why we fought for freedom in the first place, gets lost, you see. So that, 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 that's the argument that I make. For, 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 you know, because it's natural, actually, that all of us are driven by a certain degree, by this desire for self-interest, to maximize self-interest. But we must guard against that. Well, through education, through also the leaders setting the right tone at the top. It is for this reason that uh, I agree with Professor Barak on the point that to deal with corporate governance and actually the greed that uh, uh, leads to the collapse of many companies, we have to regulate all layers of governance. Start with the CEOs, the C CFOs, the boards of directors, the audit committees, and the auditors, all of them. There must be consequences when there's a company failure. All of them, corporate uh, failure. They must be regulated in a way that, you know, results. it's not only the, 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 the auditors must carry part of the blame, but really it cannot be only that. Greed is, a, is, is an issue on all these layers mm -hmm. of, of governance. So possibly, Professor, I'll also go to the main point that I make in the book. I'm saying that, um, you know, for us as people to pursue the things that are good for us, whether it's prosperity, inclusive economic growth, or so on, it's very important that we get, we can only achieve those good things through institutions, organizations, companies, and organizations that are well managed. So this thing of really uh, society in South Africa in particular now, uh, taking drastic steps to ensure that we restore trust institutions is a big agenda. I'm saying uh, in my profession, we must take more responsibility for actually um, making a contribution towards restoring trust institutions by actually making, uh, uh, make, uh, improve the quality of audit and making sure the conflicts that undermine mm. our uh, our ability to produce audit, uh, um, uh, quality, good audit quality, uh, uh, those things are addressed. But in addition to that, let's address the things that uh, Professor has been talking about in terms of all the layers of society. But I cannot uh, emphasize enough the issue of leaders embracing a moral purpose for themselves and the organizations that they run. Yes, there must be consequences when people, when they steal, when they uh, harm society, they must be jailed. They, they must be consequences for, for that. I don't deny that. But we cannot only rely on that if we want the uh, prosperity of society. We must uh, work on ourselves as leaders and uh, fulfill this expectation of moral purpose and being trusted to, to, to lead our organizations ethically and competently. I'll come to Johan's question, which will be yours, uh, Prof. Barak. Thank but you. let me ask something because of this great question, which was very intriguing, which I agreed with from Prof. Mervin when he talked about the trickle down. I think greed comes into that space as well. And also your thing about unsustainable, your, your comments about unsustainable development leading to humans consuming more of our natural mm. resources mm. than we are replenishing. Isn't that part of also of an ethic of greed and, and lack of sustainability that, that needs to be addressed? And, it, and it also didn't, it, 
in it, didn't trickle down drive inequality, which is deepening? Well, <coughs> the greed was, um, was driven by unfortunate thinking. Mm. And the unfortunate thinking arose from 1919, the famous Ford Motor Company case, where the Model T Ford was hugely successful. And in 1919, the Ford Motor Company made an extraordinary profit of 65 million US dollars in 1919, probably $6 billion today. And Henry Ford, the chairman, made a statement saying, I'm going to use the money to further modernize the plant to make it work more quickly and increase the wages of my employees to encourage them to work longer hours and maybe even weekends to meet the demand for the Model T Ford. The Dodge brothers were a minority shareholder, later a competitor. They said, wait a minute, the shareholder is the primary stakeholder mm. and you've got to first look after the shareholder before any other stakeholder. They went to court and the Supreme Court of Michigan actually declared that the shareholder is the primary stakeholder. And that 65 million was declared as a special dividend to the shareholders before increasing the wages of employees. So I tell you, that case drove that thinking. Then Milton Friedman in the 70s reinforced it with his doctrine, I paraphrase, the sole purpose of the company is to make profit without deception. Not how did you make that money became irrelevant. So, yes, greed, but it was a philosophy also that was, that was flawed, absolutely flawed. And that philosophy, unfortunately, pushed through into the 21st century. Until, until that meeting at the United Nations, I think, was a turning point. And also a turning point was when we said, the IRC said, I said, it's a social outrage what is happening, that GRI started after 1997 to try and do sustainability reporting and other people saw this as a very fruitful ground for advisory work and so other framework providers jumped into that space mm -hmm. and caused clutter and confusion for preparers mm -hmm. and users became confused <clears throat> the trustee of your pension fund has to make an informed assessment to your money to remain invested in the equity of a company and what information is he getting if he just gets an AFS according to IFRS, it's historic yeah. and, and he's got no outlook information <laughs> and yet he's going to make an information to discharge his duty to you that he's investing your money in a company that's going to be around in 30 years time when you retire. Mm. So you need that knowledge and you need that the accountability is a critical issue and you can only get to be accountable and so that the trustee of your pension fund can make an informed assessment. If you have that integrated approach, exactly what Professor Barak's talking about. And that's why integrated thinking has become so critical. I think the proudest thing in my whole career is that the Bastille of integrated thinking has been stormed. There's very few organizations in the world that still think in silos. Mm. Those who are still thinking in silos are getting uneasy and they think, no, we must think differently. We've got to, the same as education has been done in silos. We can't carry on like that. We just cannot carry on like that. So the integrated report itself is evolving. But now we have these world bodies, and I happen to be involved in it. They've said we've got to establish an international sustainability standards board. And we have the main framework providers, GRI, SASB, CDSB, CDP, TCFD, all now talking to create this one sustainability standard, which would make the life of the auditor much easier. And they're working together with the IAASB, the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, to use assurance-friendly language. So you actually have this extended emerging auditing able to actually audit these so-called non-financial, I don't believe that's a correct term, I think tangible assets is better, and you have this responsible form of, of, uh, of uh, capitalism. What is that? That you actually ask the question, how's the company made its money? 
And if it's had an adverse impact on environment, for example, how are you going to eradicate or ameliorate that in the year ahead, Mr. CEO and management? How are you going to do it? Because the critical issue is, are we as directors and managers adding value to society? It's value creation has replaced profit. Mm -hmm. And it's value creation connotes also erosion. Accountants have got to learn how to account for erosion of value. Mm -hmm. And you talk to millennials, talk to Generation Z, the young students working on, working on this campus. They're concerned on the creation of value. And will we have a habitable planet by the end of the century for our grandchildren? That's what they're concerned about. And to look at a company and just see that it's made a hundred million rand profit, EBITDA, well, that's just not sufficient anymore. Because people are looking, is it, has it really added value to society? Because if it hasn't, it should cease to exist because it's subtracting from our children and our grandchildren. So this multi-integrated approach is spreading around the world. And it's a correct, it's, it's in fact, if we don't achieve it, if we, and if we don't in the next 18 months, two years, achieve this single sustainability report, so you have a single standard which can be audited, I don't believe we're going to achieve those SDGs by 2030. Mm -hmm. And that is disastrous for planet Earth. Is the antidote to greed. Yeah. Prof. Barak, there is Johan's question. Is the current academic program spanning four years sufficient to develop all of these skills? And, and let me add, not just skills, I think also the kind of social awareness yes. that is sustainability driven mm -hmm. and value driven that we're talking about. So if I limit the answer to skills at first, definitely if you treat the skills in silos, the four years will not be enough. But you, if you introduce integrated thinking and you look at, the, at those skills from different perspectives, from a, from a business case within society, then I think it is definitely enough time. Because you, we don't want to um, educate people to be experts on what is the theory behind a specific skill. We want them to understand the skill and be able to apply that in practice and actually be an auditor performing by the end, performing that skill. If we look at the social responsibility, I think it's a mindset change. So we have to educate students from the beginning to look at the world differently. It's not only about the business case. There's a sustainability case as well. And we have to introduce that and introduce it in an integrated manner so that students can understand business and business in society, in the environment, much better. Okay. Okay. So we're running out of, yes. not running out of time, we've listed less than 10 minutes now. Yes. So I'll ask everybody to shorten their quest, their answers. There's another question directed at you, Prof Kuklu. What advice could you give the leadership of the final four auditing firms, as Prof Mervin called them, in driving towards a more values-based society instead of a rules-based society? Yes, you know, um, if you look at the history of the auditing firms in particular, they have, over the years, uh, possibly partly because of fear of litigation, they have tended to be rules-based, to really justify whatever they do through standards and laws. That, uh, to move them away from that, the challenge is to engage them in what Dr. Mervyn King is talking about, in the development of these sustainability standards. So that now, it's, it's the only way that they will come to embrace, you know, this social and, 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 and so on, and, and, and not just be limited by what the rules are. So I think uh, that's why, you know, I stress the thing about uh, moral purpose. Yes, yeah. And if, if they don't change the way that they look at themselves, but of course, given their history, they will not change on their own. It's good that there's this societal stakeholder uh, movement towards um, international sustainable standards. Mm. And they must be part of that and embrace the added responsibility mm. of equipping themselves mentally, uh, you know, with these necessary social skills, 
broader knowledge out not just technical accounting things but broader knowledge about philosophy about culture and so on so that they can fulfill this bigger role in society uh, possibly one point yeah okay yeah. Quick to yeah so i, I want just to uh, professor king you know uh, the, the question of the big four i agree with you but my reason why I, I, I think the moving from four to eight or ten is possible. I, I, I'm, I'm influenced by the, by the following thinking, that the artificial intelligence uh, algorithms and data analytics, all those solutions, the costs are going to come down and they are going to become more available. And, and, and as that happens, possibly, it's going to be possible even for other firms to, to enter the field. So I'm aware of the constraints now, but I, I, I just believe that this concentration is not good for society and it, it has to be addressed in a sustainable way that does not uh, impact negatively on, on quality. Thank you. So, so when I ask you to make a comment after this question, Prof. Mervin, who might address that as well. This is a, a continuation of the question of the institutional culture that you raised in the book. Mm. It says, is there a possibility of additional regulation of the audit profession whereby a regulator assesses the ethical organizational culture specifically, including ethical leadership of an audit firm? So <laughs> the way I read most answers here is that you do not require more regulation as such. You need to upfront address questions of ethical behavior and make sure that that is systemic in the organization. Am I correct? Yes, but this embracing of a more holistic role in society, mm -hmm. not just being the uh, checking technical compliance of, uh, uh, with IFRS and, or, or the auditing standards, looking at their role in a more holistic way. To me, that, that's, that, that should be the foundation, yeah. And if I can just make a side comment, I think the current process in the profession to revise its quality standards, to make it more proactive, so that audit firms follow a total quality management approach, I think that might also improve the culture, the quality orientated culture within the firms. And we must remember a, a, a quality, audit quality embraces ethical behaviour. Ethical behaviour is embedded in audit quality. So, mm. so I don't really uh, agree with a, a separate uh, regulator. I think, as you mm. rightly put, that we need to up our uh, position. Thank you. We now have three minutes, so one minute each for closing questions. Prof King, you have to answer that question given I have a conflict of interest because he's asking about the investor of Pretoria as a business. <laughs> with the objective of saving society, according to the King Corporate Governance. Well, I think uh, one of the important things of the King 4 report is that uh, we came to the conclusion that the world of corporations and corporate reporting had become outcomes-based with integrated thinking and integrated reporting inputs to outcomes. The SDGs were outcomes-based. So I ask the question, if reporting and accountability is becoming outcomes-based, shouldn't governance be outcomes-based? And hadn't we reached a stage where governance was a mindless checklist, becoming a grudge compliance, and not adding quality to business judgment calls by the collective mind of a board? Shouldn't there be some outcomes against which that judgment call could be tested and the four of us as directors say, but what about that outcome? What is the impact going to be on that outcome? And we came to the conclusion that there were four outcomes, and these are they. Value creation in a sustainable manner, ethical culture with effective leadership, adequate and effective internal controls with, with informed oversight by a board, and trust and confidence by the community in the organization where the organization operates with legitimacy. So I ask the question, if from an external point of view, a stakeholder looking at the University of Pretoria, will it see that it's achieving those four outcomes or is 
some judgment call being made by the council, uh, which is having an adverse impact on one of those calls. And has the university actually got a unified mind on its council? I find, with respect to the Higher Education Act, well-intended, but adverse consequences. I chaired the council at Wits University for many years. I talk from personal experience. It's had adverse consequences because you get a fragmented collective mind at council instead of a unified collective mind. And what is, what is actually the purpose of the University of Pretoria? I would believe that you're sending people out into the world who have got have been educated to add value to society, to really add value. To, that would be your purpose. Has your council agreed on the purpose of the university? Does everybody in the university know the purpose of the University of Pretoria? From the top to the students at the bottom. Because when they all come together, that's when also you have better behaviour and better ethics. The regulation of ethics and the legislation about ethical behaviour is a complete failure. You can write a code, such as the King Code. You can have codes and stewardship codes in the world. But if a person has a dishonest state of mind, no legislation will help. You look at the Public Finance Management Act as an example. It's been breached many, many times since 1996. No action has been taken, so it's fallen into disrepute. It certainly has not created ethical behaviour. And in fact, only one person has been charged so far that I know of, and he is not a public servant, and he is an Italian singer called Mr. Agrizi. <laughs> He's the only person that's been charged. So you ask yourself, can you legislate or regulate um, an ethical state of mind? The answer is no. The question is, are you really, do you really appreciate, for example, as an external auditor, that you've got a position that you're giving assurance to outsiders who don't want to rely on Mervyn King as a director saying, this is what's happened inside the company, you want the assurance of an independent third party to say this is a fairly a fair view of what is happening inside the company. And you need that assurance and it's critical to the value of society. So the critical question being asked today about organizations is how are you adding value to society? That's okay. the critical issue. And Generation Z that's what, that's, that's what they're concerned about, people who are up to 22 years of age. Millennials, I, as an advisor, people talk about diversity on boards, gender, race. But what about intergenerational diversity? Have you got younger people on your, in your council? Those that have fought the millennials. And then on the side have an advisory committee of Generation Z. They can't be council members, too young. But have a non-disclosure agreement, a good faith clause agreement with them and talk to them, say, this is the issue, give me some input. Now, my experience when you talk to those younger people, they come up with an idea that the millennials haven't even come up with. And you start thinking differently. It shifts, it shifts the behavior of people. I Papa, just, I have to yeah. stop you. <laughs> okay, I'll that, finish. We'll go to you for another one of this, because that is where the conversation ought to go. And this place, Future Africa, is asking those questions. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. 30 seconds each. We are actually <laughs> way out of time because it's so interesting. No, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity for introducing uh, uh, the book. My main issue is that uh, in South Africa we are faced with a crisis of eroded trust of the public of institutions. They have lost trust in leadership. And I'm challenging through this book and say that, look at yourself, whether really you are measuring up in terms of placing the public interest above your own. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Prof, 30 seconds. I will. I believe that educators need to play a very important role because we work with the youth, we work with Generation Y, the Millennials, Generation Z, 
and we have to influence them. We've got an opportunity. We have to use that. No, I'd like to thank uh, Prof Nkutu, of course, for writing the book. Writing books is very, very important. I always say that in Africa, sometimes we lack institutional memory and reflective memoirs that uh, uh, educate uh, uh, the public. Thank you, thank Prof, Prof. Mervyn King, for gracing us. And I'm serious that we'll call you back for a very dedicated <laughs> session. And thank you, Prof yes. Barak. I would like also, I'm holding the book, I'd like to say this book is available at all leading retailers, like, for example, exclusive books. Go and buy the book. There's no substitute to reading it for yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.